They said I wouldn't make it. They said I wouldn't be here today. They said I'd never amount to anything. But I'm glad to say that I'm on my way. And I'm going more and more each day.
God for you. I want to, just for a short moment, uh, bring you the third sermon in this series entitled Discipleship. And as God should guide, the Lord said, what better way to further their understanding than to use Jesus as the example? So I just want to pull just one verse from the Gospel of Matthew, the 27th chapter, and verse 46. The King James Version reads thusly, And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. That is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And just for the few moments we've got, I want to talk about a temporary inconvenience for permanent improvements. Uh, in Wyoming, there are a lot of areas that are untouched by man. They have become known as God's country. In one of their largest and most famous wildernesses, is the Brigger Wilderness located in central Wyoming. It is comprised of 428,087 acres of land. And it has more than 600 miles of trails that provide access to its seemingly boundless area. It has elevations ranging from 8,000 feet to 13,000 feet. And to put that in perspective, there's only 5,280 feet in a mile. Amen. In July and August, mosquitoes and biting flies are pesky, uh, making tents and bug repellent a must. Uh, they see deer, they see moose, elk, uh, they see gray wolves, grizzly, and black bears. All are just a few of the many wildlife species found in this wilderness. Uh, the following are actual responses from comment cards given to the staff members at Brigger Wilderness Area from those who have visited the area. They read like this, trails need to be reconstructed. Please avoid building trails that go uphill. Too many bugs and leeches and spiders and spider webs. Please spray the wilderness to rid the areas of these pests. Please pave the trails. Chair lifts need to be in some places so that we can see the wonderful views without having to hike to them. The coyotes made too much noise last night and kept me awake. Please eradicate these annoying animals. A small deer came into my camp and stole my jar of pickles. Is there a way that I can get reimbursed? Please call me. Escalators would help on the steep uphill sections. A McDonald's would be nice on the trailway. Uh, too many rocks in the mountains. Uh, these comments and complaints indicate that the people who made them do not really understand what it means to be in a wilderness area. They were looking for something convenient and comfortable, but not truly a wilderness experience. In, in the same way, preachers, I, I found out that many people do not understand what it really means to be a genuine Christian or disciple. There are multitudes that often follow Jesus or claim to be a Christian, but they do so on their terms and not on his terms. They do it truly, they don't truly comprehend the biblical definition of a disciple. Uh, because of this ignorance, there are many who consider themselves to be followers of Jesus who really are not, even though in many ways they do look like followers of Jesus. They go to church, they have a profession of faith, they read their Bibles, they even give in the offering, but, but they are not 
the real deal, or at least they are not living and thinking like the real deal. Jesus confronts this problem in our text. He, he, he makes very clear what it means to be a Christian and, and a disciple and a follower of his father. I, I just want to just, just for a moment talk about what Jesus went through and, and what we ought to be going through in order to be considered true disciples of his. Uh, 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 Jesus, Jesus, especially when we, when we talk about this word disciple, it, it, it's usually well over 200 times mentioned in the four Gospels and the book of Acts. Yet, interestingly enough, it is not found in any of the other remaining 22 books which make up the New Testament. G Jesus in our text defines it for us. Uh, a disciple is a true follower of Jesus Christ. In other words, what we call a Christian can also be synonymously used as disciple. If you are a Christian, then you are a disciple. If you are not a disciple of Jesus, defines it then that you are then not a Christian. Uh, the two terms, disciple and Christian, mean the same thing in the same way. When I talk about my wife, First Lady Elfrida, and my spouse, they are two yet the same. In fact, the term disciple occurs 269 times in the New Testament, uh, while the term Christian only occurs three times. In the book of Acts, we're told that the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. This makes clear that the terms are interchangeable. I, I, I want to make this clear so that you understand that what Jesus was actually living in was actually a discipleship life. He was a disciple to his father, and we are to be his disciples. Uh, anyone who does not, he says in Luke, Jesus says in Luke 14, 27, anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. This could also be phrased as, anyone who does not carry his cross or her cross and follow me cannot be a Christian. That phrasing somehow gets our attention and makes more clear the seriousness of the issue about Jesus teaching us about being a disciple. Uh, so we catch up with him here. Uh, and without a deep understanding of what he's going through in this moment, uh, we can conclude that this is one of the deepest and darkest mysteries of God's holiness. Without understanding, we are struck with terror and amazement and horror and even shock. When we hear the uh, eternal, only begotten son of the father cry out Eloi Eloi lama sabachthani my, my God my God why hast thou forsaken me discipleship is a challenging thing for a believer and that's why I just wanted to take a few moments and look at this shocking and largely incomprehensible words of Christ on the cross hey, and talk about a temporary inconvenience for permanent improvement. I, I'm going to give you three points about becoming a disciple and leave you alone. Po point number one, in, in all of his all, the wonder and humility, uh, Christ's words, point number one, it talks about a relationship that's rattled. Uh, we would do well to remember that after being hung on the cross, uh, that cruel means of Roman execution, for at least three hours, these words were uttered by the eternal Son of God. As the only begotten Son of the Father, he, he from eternity had existed in perfect love and holy love and communion with his Father. He, he was not a son who only called and communicated with his Father when he wanted or needed something. Somebody say amen. amen. He was not neglectful to the training and the guidance of his father. He did not become of age and then do his own thing. He was from the beginning about his father's business, doing it his father's way and following his father's will. Never had he experienced a moment of disharmony, strain, or even disruption in this perfect divine fellowship. We have no way of knowing the joy and the glory and the bliss 
midst of such perfect, perfect, sacred communion with God. We have some clues in the Gospels themselves as to the holy, intimate heights from which this relationship fell. This perfect relationship got rattled. It, it got rattled because of you and because of me. It, it got rattled simply because of your sin and my sin and our salvation. And I'm suggesting this evening, this morning, that the impact of what our sin did on their relationship is largely unimaginable and incomprehensible. Uh, the Son of God who had given up his divinity for our humanity, who had given up uh, his divineness to become one of us, now under the conditions of time, space, and flesh, now under conditions of fallen sinful humanity, experiences the total disruption of his relationship with his Father. In words of our text, we see that on from Jesus' side, under the conditions and limitations of fallen human consciousness for the first time of all eternity, he loses all contact with his heavenly father. Uh, imagine how the families must feel of those who got lost in that Malaysian airline. Uh, imagine how Hannah Graham's mother and father and all of her relatives feel going into the fourth week of not being able to find a trace of her. Imagine if your heavenly father, your earthly father, who was once a loving father involved in your life, who communicated with you regularly, all of a sudden cut off communication and for whatever reason no longer wanted anything to do with you. Uh, imagine if you would, uh, your lover, your best friend, Friend, your confidant, your supporter, your provider, whoever it is that has your heart and is dear to your heart, all of a sudden cuts off communication with you. I hope I got a pray in church this morning. Jesus lost all awareness of his father's help or his presence. There was no longer an audible voice on the other end. The screen on Jesus' side went completely blank. So he's agonizingly cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? All I'm suggesting is that if you want to be his disciples, every now and then it will feel like you've lost contact with your father. Your finances get all messed up and you've prayed but there is no answer. You've had some physical issues. Then a family member dies and while you're trying to get up physically and spiritually, things get worse rather than better and you're beginning to wonder, where is God? Does, does he hear me? Does he care about me? Has he heard my cry? Jesus, even though he was the son of God, now in this moment lives totally by faith with no sight of his heavenly father. Somebody say amen. He has no signs, no physical reminders, no present evidences of, of father, his father's care and presence. Jesus feels, senses, and experiences abandonment as if God has left him, as if God has left him totally alone in his greatest hour of need. The relationship was rattled. So he cries out, my God, why has you, have you forsaken me? Webster defines forsaken as to renounce as something once cherished, to renounce without intent to recover or resume, to quit or to leave it entirely, to withdraw from, or to abandon. Anybody in the house ever been forsaken or abandoned? Uh, thought you had a good thing going with your boo or your honey or your sweetheart, and, and thought you had a good thing going on with your job, your health, and your finances, then all of a sudden, something happens that rattles that relationship, and what you thought you had becomes no more. You don't know why, you don't know when it happened, but, but what you do know is that you have been forsaken. Jesus finds himself forsaken, but thanks be unto God. God, that there is no reason to believe that in the midst of his deep agony that he fell into sin and unbelief. My God, like, like many of us would probably have done, every time you get a hard time pressing on you, you begin to question whether God can not only save you, but whether God can see you through. You begin to question, what did I do? Well, I've got news for you. Anything we do, the best we can do it is still
still not good enough for God. We have sinned, and the Bible says we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So no matter how good you sing, how well you preach, how well you pray, how well you treat other family members, how well you treat your neighbor, you are still a sinner saved by grace. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus here is brought to the ultimate test, to the brink of his faith. No, his words are not those of unbelief or accusations, but they are true, a true testimony of his present devastating experience. These words are a testimony of the depth of which he went for us and for our salvation. He experienced for us, the God abandonment, which would have, we would have experienced had he not gone through it in our place and on our behalf. I, let, 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 me, let me say that again. He experienced for us the God abandonment, which we would have experienced if he had not gone through it in our place and on our behalf. And while he was going through it, I can hear his father telling him, I know that our relationship is rattled, but just hold on, son. It's just a temporary inconvenience for a permanent improvement. Every now and then, God allows our relationship with him to be rattled to see if you have what it takes to be a real disciple of his. And anyone can serve him when you're on the mountaintop, when you're singing your song and praying your prayer and the bills are paid and your health is good and the children are happy and the children are healthy. Friends are faithful and your enemies are few. All is well. I can be his disciple when I'm riding on the mountaintop, but the question is, when you get in the valley and you feel like you've been for and you can't find him and you look to the right and you look to the left and he's nowhere to be found. That is when your faith is truly tested because the relationship is rattled. Uh, number, number, number two, number two, number two. There is a respectful response. Uh, for the first thing that we see is that Jesus' words are actually his prayer. Uh, although he had no direct sense of God's presence, and nevertheless, he prayed to God, his father. He is quoting the lines from Psalm 22. He remembers scripture. He remembers the word of God. Even in this moment for his most uh, severe trial, Jesus prays scripture. He calls out, my God, my God, even when God seemed far away. And it seemed as if he had been left in a helpless and hopeless condition. God was still his God. And God is still our God. I don't care what you're going through, what it looks like, what it feels like, what it resembles. When you get in a pickle, when you get back in the corner, pray the word of God. Trust and never doubt. And I know that I've got a witness. He will surely bring you out. When your stuff is all messed up and things are not going to your liking, there is still a respectful response. We've got to understand that it is through him that we live, move, and have our being. And you've got to start praying in his word. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. If you feel like you've been abandoned, all I'm telling you right now is just start praying in his word. Storm clouds may rise. Strong winds may blow, but I've found a savior, and do I have a witness? He's sweet, I know. Jesus, Jesus by sheer faith is praying to his heavenly father. He, he knows that his present awareness does not tell the whole truth. God will be faithful even when it seems like he is not there. This 22nd Psalm, David goes on to encourage those who are afflicted to nevertheless trust in God, and he points forward to a time when it will become clear again that God is faithful, that God does deliver, that God does rescue 
that God does set you free. He will make you whole. He does still save. Do I have a witness? If you just hold on, I guarantee your victory will be yours. Our enemy will try to tell us to fold, to pack our bags, to go and abandon our God. I don't know about you, but I've come this far by faith, and I'm leaning on his everlasting arms. God says, I will make your enemies your footstool. He said, I'll make you the head and not the tail. Just to know that whatever you're going through, it is a temporary inconvenience for a permanent improvement. And even if you don't see him right now, even if you don't feel him right now, you just got to trust him. And I know I've got a witness in the house. When you trust him, he will see you through. Do I have a witness? Won't he bless you in the city? He'll bless you in the field. He'll bless you when you come and when you go. All you got to do is trust him. Say yes. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus wraps this thing up. And number one, he says that when you are trying to be my disciple, the relationship is going to feel like it's rattled. Secondly, there is a respectful response. You got to know your word and pray in the word. But thirdly, and finally, he says we know that Jesus speaks these words from an irrational reason. From, from a human perspective, the reason for these words and the reason for Jesus' question to his father uh, from, from a human perspective were irrational. That, it, it didn't make sense. It, it's irrational. After all, he, he was the only begotten son of God who had been sent and was born without sin. But yet he became the lamb of God, now slain for the sins of the world. That's your sins and mine. And because... He became sin for us. We learn of the shocking depth of our sin. Jesus, the very Son of God, experiences God forsaking him only because he took upon himself your sins, my sins, and the sins of the world. Our sinfulness, our rebellion, our disobedience, our adultery were all placed on him that they might be judged, condemned, and undone. Somebody say amen. amen. Jesus became sin for us, and his father forsook him. He was forsaken by his father so that he might be forgiven, healed, and reconciled back to God. His humanity said it was irrational. Why am I being hung on this cross? I didn't do nothing. But his divinity remind him it was by design. Your father birthed you. Your father created you for this very moment. He speaks these words. But in speaking, he reveals the true intentions of Satan and the effects of evil. Sin, if it had its way, would destroy every last one of us, every God creature, but use us and destroy us to try to ultimately destroy God. Sin hates all life and goodness, all holiness and love. Sin messes up. It tears up and leaves you all jacked up. I wish I had a witness in the house. When Jesus bore the sins of the world on his cross, all hell broke loose in an attempt to kill God by breaking apart the holy eternal relationship of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I wish I had a praying church in here. Evil attempted to drive a wedge of suspicion, unbelief, and fear between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and therefore overthrow God. The real cross cost of Christ's crucifixion was not so much physical, although that, that was certainly a real part of it, but much more he suffered the pain and agony of having his perfect communion with his Father attacked and separated. I don't know if you've ever seen a baby that 
that has been taken away from his mother. That baby will smile. That baby will grin in the mother's arm, but take it away from his mother. Let it stay for a while. That baby will cry. Bloody tears will come from the eyes. She will holler. It will scream until it gets back to the mother. The devil wanted to break the communion between Jesus and his father. He wanted to make sure that you and I could never have a way back to the rightness, to the richness, to the righteousness of God given to us by our father. Do I have a witness in the house? God says, son, I've got to leave you and forsake you, but that was just a temporary inconvenience for permanent improvement in order to see us freed from the power of sin, from God's own judgment upon sin. I've got to turn my back on you. It's just a temporary inconvenience for permanent improvement. I'm going to leave you alone. First Lady Alfreda can cook with the best of cooks. I don't mind getting stuff and cleaning up because she cooks and she cooks well. And when we are having a lot of guests, she'll say, honey, I need for you to make a few stops. Can you go over to Safeway and get their peppercorn seasoning? They have the best in the land. Can you stop by Giant and get their cooking oil? They have the fewest calories. Can you go to Wegmans and pick up a few pieces of salmon? Theirs come from the real sea and not as farm raised. Can you go to D.C. Harbor and pick up some oysters? They are fresh and they are big. Can you go to Costco's and get their seasoning for the steak? Costco's has the best that is in the area. And when I sit down to the table, I know when I sit down, the food will be just as good, if not better than the Capitol Grill, the Prime Rev, Georgia Brown's, Ruth Chris Steakhouse, Michelle's Richard's, Citronelle. But when I clean the kitchen, I have died and I have improved. And all my running around was just a temporary inconvenience for permanent improvement. I don't know about you, but Jesus says in Matthew 28 and 12, the summation of the matter, I will be with you always even until the end of the world. I'll be with you in the good times. I'll be with you in the bad times. When you feel like I'm not there, know that my spirit is leading you, protecting you, anointing you, appointing you, forgiving you, loving you. Say yes, say yes, say yes. I don't know what you're going through. But God sent me to tell you it's only temporary. He's got a plan for you. He's going to lift you. He's going to bless you above your wildest dreams because he's God all by himself. Say yes. Say yes. Say yes.